Uh, I just want to begin by saying uh, thank you to all the organizers of this uh, excellent forum uh, for, for putting it on and for inviting me to participate. Uh, it's a great opportunity and uh, appreciate being here once again on Musqueam unceded lands. And likewise, as others have expressed, really appreciate any opportunity to uh, hear our elder Larry Grant open these types of events with his uh, sharing of his wisdom. I'm going to talk today about um, our experience, a part of our experience at Stalo Nation, which is just upriver, um, the Halkamalem, upriver Halkamalem speaking peoples of Helmuch and Stalo. Uh, our experience at Stalo with regard to digital information, digital data, um, which, which includes a range of experience from library and archives uh, to genealogies um, and otherwise what I'm going to focus on today, which is uh, heritage-based information and what we've come to create as a Stalo Heritage Database, which, as you see in the, in the title to this presentation, is a factor of representing cultural landscapes by way of digital data. Um, when you look around and you see where we are in Lower Mainland, we're sitting here in the western end of Sa'alth Tamak, and I think if you, if you listen closely to Larry Grant this morning, he did mention that word Sa'alth Tamak, and it's our world, it's our land. Uh, it's the Lower Fraser River watershed in English. It's this territory here. What, you, what do you see when you're looking at this image? What's being represented to you? Um, and in this image, do you see uh, Stalo Coast Salish peoples? Uh, do you see their landscape? Uh, we find that typically, the vast majority of people out there in the world see something recognizable to them and their, their, their historical cultural backgrounds, but they oftentimes are oblivious to a Stalo Coast Salish landscape in which they live. Um, and, and part of the theme to, the, to this session is respecting rights while providing access to digital content. So if you don't know something's there, it's difficult to respect the rights of the people who, who live here, maintain long-standing traditions of knowledge, uh, holding, sharing, and privilege, and who maintain long-standing deep-rooted connections to the land and the resources uh, for purposes of, of practice, uh, of, of embedded knowledge, maintaining an archive in the land of, of, of important information, um, and require maintenance of that landscape in order to maintain a fundamental, what I would call cultural archive of information and knowledge that's housed in this landscape, this cultural landscape that surrounds us. Um, we need to be re respectful of that, uh, and it's appropriate to follow Chilcotin, who recently were um, recognized for the first time ever in Canada for title to the land. And I think that's the ultimate respect for rights that we're talking about here in this context. Um, we're looking at it from that regard, from the outside as well as from the inside, and the need to represent the the land, the cultural landscape in a way that people can recognize so that rights that exist there can be respected. And when you, so the so question is how do we do this? Uh, we, we have over the years mapped things um, that are in this case uh, an aspect of history that goes back to the distant past and accounts for transformation places, uh, places. Um, as, as you drive through the land in the central Fraser Valley, you notice uh, Thethel K and Squame, two, two key mountain peaks that look out over the central Fraser Valley that are in fact Trolquiam places. Uh, there's Slalakum places. Uh, they're all intangible in a way and yet are, are manifest in, in the land and take form. Uh, they're supernatural beings, so to speak, that uh, inhabit certain parts of the land and require attendance and, and attention to maintain their habitat, so to speak. Shwaikwe, um, again, uh, Larry mentioned representation of Shwaikwe in, in the, the raven figure in the pole behind us. Uh, there's an image here, it's a Skokale, uh, old Skokale uh, band hall of a Shwaikwe masked dancer. Um, information associated with that, again, highly privileged. Uh, all of what I'm showing you has different degrees of, of caretaking of ownership and privilege in terms of access, and, and Shwaikwe is one of those areas that is, I would say, the most, um, that and, and 
and winter dance, but uh, Shuaikwe in particular, probably the most privileged set of knowledge that's housed within Stalico Salish people. And yet, most important to protect, one of those very most important, very sacred and most important uh, aspects of, of, of the culture to protect, that does again require linkages to the landscape. So Alma, water babies, uh, inhabit certain places throughout the territory. This is Chilliwack Lake at the upper end of the Chilliwack River Valley. Uh, and Smithla, again, something that we rarely are able to talk about or even know much about unless you're an initiate into, into winter dance. Uh, everything I'm showing you is, is public and has been approved for, for presentation purposes. There's lots of stuff that I won't show you. But end of the day, these are all things that are necessarily um, are necessary to respect. And so we've focused on digitizing, in a sense, collecting this information through what others have talked about, traditional youth studies uh, going back to the, to the late 90s. Um, talking to elders going back to the 1970s with, with the collection of place names data. And then ultimately, in the last, I would say, 10, 10 to 15 years, looking at translating written or recorded uh, records into digital forms within geographic information systems. And some time ago, I, I wrote this piece that was sort of set out a, a framework of saying, well, we need some kind of common language to convey this information and to be able to share. Uh, within, the, within the protocols of sharing that, that are established uh, within, within this Stalo society. And GIS is a common language to be able to do that. And we kind of move that direction in, in, in the manner of warehousing this information, uh, taking care of it, organizing it, and bringing it together from various sets of data that existed, place names, warehouse here, archaeological sites information here, traditional use information here. Uh, over the past five years or so, we've converged that into a Stalo Heritage Database, which is, which is brought, uh, harmonized, uh, centralized, and which allows us to um, draw from in representing the Stalo uh, uh, cultural landscapes. And I'll use the term here, Huilitam, as well. So the idea is that let's, let's use this information as a, as a means of, of creating awareness and providing a representation of Stalo peoples, relations to the land, and, and able to compare that and relate it to Hulitam, our, uh, our Western society, provincial and federal and so on, uh, authorities and otherwise also invisible landscapes, to merge them, represent that as well, and put them together to see what that relationship actually is, which is otherwise quite invisible to us. And that's been our direction and our efforts over the past, uh, really, uh, quite five to ten years. And so I'll flip through a few of these kind of, their maps. They come across commonly as maps, but beyond the maps are the digital warehouse that allow us to represent these features of the land in various ways. So, Shuokoyan uh, places within Sa'altima. Chacha places, uh, these are largely Stlalikum places within Sa'altima. These are archaeological sites or uh, housings of belongings within Sa'al Tamak, containers of knowledge. These are place names within Sa'al Tamak. And again, looking at this place names, do, how many place names do you know? How many places that are named do you know that are actually little points like that? You know, very few. There are some very small sites, but uh, in large part, we've been working to get them on in the system and also then to render them in terms of um, an accurate area, a polygon which in itself carries a, a fair bit of challenge and requires really deep thinking. And if you're doing this maintenance of your records and methodologies is the metadata uh, that's extremely important to leave a track record of what you're doing, how you're doing it, and why you're doing it for those who are coming after you. Uh, and, and place names are, are very much a challenge this way, but necessary to represent in order to apply in the manner that we're speaking of. Hunting, harvesting uh, places, terrestrial harvesting, fishing sites. And so again, going back to the range of rights that we're respecting here, it ranges from the individual. Individuals within Stalo society have rights to particular places, maintain property rights that are transferred through, through time and through familial lines and through names. Um, so it ranges from the individual to families to broader collectives. And ultimately, when you put this all together, you're looking at a Stalo collective, uh, uh, of the people of the world representation of aspects of the cultural landscape. And this is only part of that picture. That needs to be respected, in, in which we use this digital data to, to represent in this manner. Okay, so you look at this and, is, and, and you know, what is that? 
Well, it's really a representation of digital information that can be used to protect these places, take care of them when their pressures come from the outside world. It's a curriculum. Others have mentioned the use of this information for educational purposes. Absolutely. It's the, it's the, it's the value that you're seeing here in the representation of knowledge that's in a, transferred into a digital form that allows us to really add value to this and, 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 and use this information in, in useful ways that are ways most useful to the community as they see fit. But ultimately, again, in respect of the need to do this for the collective rights that exist, but also understanding and necessarily understanding the rights of the knowledge holders who have provided this information throughout all of these years, which is, I think, one, uh, one of our earlier presenters mentioned, sometimes can be challenging in, in, in the context of the community itself when privileged information about spiritual practice areas like bathing sites or places where people are putting their regalia out into the forest for, for protection not to be touched, not to be interacted with, confidential information in a sense, um, that information is provided to us for particular purposes of protection, but not to be provided to other community members. So when folks are asking for it, we cannot divulge that information even within their own community because of the circumstances and limitations placed on that information as shared to us by the knowledge holders or the practitioners. And so you need to be true to that. Okay. And, in bringing visibility and recognition uh, and communicating all of this, we see it as a factor of moving through reconciliation and let's, let's get on the same page with the, the, between societies here, um, establishing governmental relationships. Uh, this is a foundation to do that effectively and we found that to be true. But it also raises a significant challenge as we continue to elevate our relationship with British Columbia, for example. So their crown lands Right? And their interests overlap substantially with that picture that I just showed you of Stalo lands and interests. Um, and in order to reconcile those interests, potentially and often conflicting, it's, you need to share the information in some manner. And so you move to build trust. It's really, uh, it allows the building of trust to have the access to the information to potentially share. But we find ourselves at a point as that relationship builds and grows and trust develops, there comes a time where we're going to have to and necessarily for our benefit share this information uh, with the province, intergovernmental sharing. I think that's the next step and we're very cautious in approaching that and developing information sharing guidelines and so on, but to a common benefit of, of elevating this degree of recognition and respect for Stalo rights and title. And taking care of what belongs to us is a common saying. And that means taking care of the knowledge, taking care of the digital information as a means of taking care of the land and the resources and the people. Um, confidentiality, I question what that is. In our experience, what is it that is confidential? What does that word mean? Why are we using that word? Um, and ultimately, if something is truly confidential, more than being you can have it but use it with limited to a limited degree or limit the access to it. Uh, we don't want it if it's confidential. That's personal information. Should not come to us to include in our warehouse. All right, so I think we, we draw a distinction between confidentiality, meaning something that don't give to us, versus limited access and use for particular purposes. That's different. Uh, and I know that it, because of the pressures in the, in the land and the pressures on the, on the, la on the land and the people um, from this urban development here moving eastward over time and continuing so. The massive pressures on the land and the resources, if you could see them, it's astounding uh, to visualize as we can now the, the provincial interests and the development interests on the land. It's phenomenal. Um, blew me away the first time we were able to manifest that digitally. Uh, the, the old way of keeping things secret does not work as, a, as an effective means of protecting places and people and sites. And so it causes us to reconsider that word confidential and, to, understand, and to, call it, well, to cause us to question and look into more deeply what it is that we need to do to take care of what belongs to us and to reconsider what confidential means and where information can and should be shared and how it can be shared, going back to uh, understanding why um, folks over the past hundred years have largely guarded 
uh, information that's very important to them. Um, and in certain cases, that still works. In certain cases, it doesn't. And so we're on the verge of a place where it doesn't work very well in many instances. And so it forces us to, as we build this information base, really address those points of, of um, protocols to access and use. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it at that. I think we're still in time, or is there much time left? Lots of time left. Okay, then forget it. I'm going on. <laughs> no, that says I'm done, but I'm not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. Well, we'll 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 call it. A, I can go on and on, but I won't. Um, and these, I'll just I'll just end with this slide here, which is you know these are some of the the aspects of of relationships that are emerging these days and becoming points of, uh, of discussion around this type of information and these questions with strategic engagement agreements and consultation accommodation processes and shared decision making all emerging out of this increasing recognition and respect of uh, indigenous rights and title as they exist still here in British Columbia and throughout Canada. Uh, so we're, we're actively affecting this change and, and all of what you're talking about here today is a part of that. So I'll say lahai at this point, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>